Well, hello out there. Uh, my name is Jason Kimberly. I'm the executive pastor here at Church Alive. And today we are continuing our journey to grab as many candidates as possible before the election on November 3rd. Uh, so joining us today is Joy Garrett. Welcome. I, I appreciate Hi. you joining us this today. Uh, she is the incumbent for District 29. Now, Joy, can you Joy share with us today is Joy Garrett. My bad. <laughs> on me, guys. My apologies. Um, so, Joy, District 29. Now, that is the far side of Albuquerque, correct? Yeah. Jason, it goes from Ladera Drive. That's the southern border, which goes over to 98th, and then to I-40, all the way out to the Rio Puerco, the mighty Rio Puerco. Oh, wow. All the way out there. Yes, it does. Wow. Um, then it goes north to the uh, Sandoval County line, so everything to the river up to Sandoval County, and then it runs along Unser, everything west of Unser, and then as you get to the newer developments, um, like after, um, oh, probably after Western Sky, it has the new... Uh, eastern developments. Okay. So yeah, it's it's the largest area that's within Albuquerque. Yeah, that's a big geographic location. It's big for geographic sure. and one of the fastest growing because all the west side houses are built. Um, I had a losing race three years ago, and since that time, probably about two thousand homes have been built. Oh wow! So I think when redis when redistricting comes up after the census. We'll see a few changes. Okay. Wow. Well, that's great. Now, you're going to be going up against Adelius Stith. He's a Republican candidate after, um, uh, well, he was the only one that was represented on the Republican side for the ticket uh, Tuesday. So yeah. we know now for sure it's official. You'll be going up against Adelius. Um, now, for those of you out here, just so that you know, uh, our heart here at Church Alive, we wanted to come across and uh, just have a journey with all of our candidates, starting as close to the geographic location of Church Alive as possible, uh, but then also extending as far as we could manageably uh, do throughout greater Albuquerque uh, to just bring an awareness not only for our church, but for our church networks, and then also as a favor to our community uh, to extend that awareness and that knowledge so that you're as informed as possible uh, to make your, uh, the decision that's right for you going into November 3rd. Uh, you will be able to uh, ask Joy a question or two if you would care to do so. You're welcome to do that. You can go on to our website at churchaliveabq.com and right on the home page there is a chat into our v uh, Vimeo location. You can also log on to YouTube at Church Alive ABQ. Uh, or Facebook Live on our Church Alive Facebook page. Uh, feel free to uh, log in to any of those locations. And if you have a particular question, we're going to have, I'll have several questions myself for her, but at the end of our conversation, I'll extend that opportunity and see if I can echo your question to her while we are live as well. Uh, so, um, at Joy, uh, coming back to our conversation, I just tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're a teacher at Jimmy Carter Middle School. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the incumbent for District 29. Uh, give us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I think most importantly, I'm happily married. I have an incredibly loving, supportive husband, Dr. Dale Garrett, who is writing a novel. He's a retired teacher. I have a wonderful son, Dejo Garrett, who's a budding entrepreneur and cleans COVID masks uh, oh, wow. by night at uh, downtown Presbyterian. And I'm an educator. So one of the reasons I ran is because I've always taught at Title I schools with a lot of poverty and issues, working family issues. And I felt when I looked at what was happening in the state legislature, I felt like I didn't always agree what, with, what was happening. But one thing I was raised to do is don't complain. Be the change. Either don't say anything or communicate and do something. So I've written letters, I've called, I've testified at committees about issues, and finally I thought it's time for me to step up to the plate and, and see if I can do a better job because it's very difficult to put yourself out there. No matter what you do, 
good, bad, indifferent, somebody's going to criticize you. Certainly. And um, I was willing to take that. And um, the sad thing about our society is sometimes people don't listen to you unless you have a position. So people that I wrote letters to five years ago who never responded, when I call up and say, this is Representative Joy Garrett, they suddenly listen. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be a voice for people who haven't been listened to. I know what it's like not to be listened to. Um, so I have really appreciated the opportunity to serve. And because it's been inspirational and because I've been able to get some things done, I'm running for re-election. Um, are there particular issues that you'd say are, are you're most passionate about? Are there specific things that, are, are, that drove this? Um, is it just kind of a hard in, in general to just be the change? Um, you know, tell, us, tell us a little bit about your particular issues that you're most passionate about. I'm most passionate about education. I know how hard teachers work, and at the same time, I know the lack of teachers that we've had. So one of my first baby bill that I escorted through the whole process and really learned about how to legislate was Grow Your Own Teachers Act. And that gives scholarships to educational assistants who've worked for two years. They have a track record. They know they want to teach, um, but they don't have money because our educational assistants are the lowest paid on the totem pole. So this act gives scholarships to those people and it's engendered a lot of cooperative efforts between universities and colleges of education, CNM, UNM, but universities across the state that are now working with school districts to make programs that pay attention to an EA's schedule. They plan classes sometimes on weekends or evenings that don't interfere. But the EA, the great benefit is they get a scholarship that they don't have to pay back. So that's something I'm proud of because if we're going to get more teachers in our state, desperately needed profession, we have to support people in getting there. So that, that's my number one issue. Um, because I'm a West Sider, um, I asked to be on the Transportation Committee. We need to develop roads. Um, in talking to the fire chief, he talks about how sometimes the fire trucks and the emergency um, medical personnel can't get to places because of like the crowds on Paseo del Norte and other places. So that infrastructure issue um, is not so sexy, but it's vital to the safety and well-being of Westsiders. So Certainly. transportation, education are my big two, and public safety. We really have to address public safety um, by adequately funding our law enforcement. But something that I've really learned about is the infrastructure. For example, sometimes you'll see a, a policeman or policewoman in a car and you're thinking, well, they're just sitting there. Actually, on a 10-hour shift, sometimes two to four hours is spent doing computer input because the technology systems don't speak to each other. So in learning a lot about that, I'm passionate about giving our law enforcement the tools they need to be effective in their service to all of us. Wow. Um, so a few questions that might be in the interest of the church, and, yeah. and you might have actually addressed a couple of them already in, in what you just shared, but you know, one of the most uh, crucial issues and central to most in the church is the preservation of the family unit. Uh, I know this can be a broad topic because it encompasses, you know, so many aspects, uh, protection of parental rights, family safety, education, as you shared, uh, family health, um, sexual orientation, uh, and just keeping the family unit together as much as possible. Uh, so I know this is a broad question, obviously, but, right. but ultimately, what are you looking to prioritize to, to strengthen the family unit? First of all, I think the family is the school of love. That's where we learn about what a loving relationship is. That's where we learn how to parent. Um, all the dimensions of love occur there. It's also the hardest school. And I think that many people enter marriage. Um, in our state, many people skip the marriage and they enter the family without much education. 
And so one thing that I've been talking to some fellow legislators uh, on both sides of the aisle about is how, how can legislation strengthen people's understanding of families, of child rearing, of, child, of the development of a child, and I feel personally that we need to have a course in high school and unfortunately I would say not in their senior year because a lot of our kids still are dropping out. A class where they really study child development so they know how a baby develops. Um, one of the most devastating experiences to me as a teacher was to see on the front pages of the Albuquerque Journal a picture of my former fifth grade student arrested for the murder of his child. Mm. And because I was aware of that child's situation, I know that his parenting was not all that we would hope it would be. And obviously he had issues. He had substance abuse issues, relationship issues. So I feel like it would be helpful to have a class required in the high school curriculum where students really examine child development and understand um, what it is for a baby to develop, how you take care of a child, and some basic relationship skills. I think that is a way to strengthen families in New Mexico. We have an incredible rich heritage. Our native traditions, our Hispanic traditions, our African American traditions, all the traditions in our state have some rich a resource to draw on, and I think we need to incorporate those with such a course. So that's that's something I'm looking into. One, one thing I've learned is legislation develops over time. Um, some bills will pass, and they're 10 years in the making because so much vetting of the law has to be done. You have to bring all the stakeholders in um, to talk about things and to get their perspectives. But, but that's something I'm looking at currently that I hope to pursue in the next, it, it may be two years, it may be four years, but it's something I feel passionate about. Well, um, that's fantastic. The, um, one of the questions that I might have is um, the issue of preservation of life. I know mm -hmm. uh, we all know how divided it, this, this topic is um, in the country. Certainly New Mexico is front and center with it as well. Um, you know, many would have the question as far as the, uh, the, the preservation of life, questions on, you know, protecting the, the unborn, and then also the end of life, near the end of life. Both are very controversial subjects. Um, where do you stand on these issues? Because I know as we go into this next cycle, uh, New Mexico is going to be front and center with this as well. And uh, so share with us, uh, what, are you, uh, what are you looking to accomplish uh, in this area? After a lot of, I'm a prayer person. I pray about everything. I get down on my knees and pray. My husband and me start our day with prayer, um, with our family when our son's present, but all three of us. So these are the issues that keep me up at night. Um, let's say the word, abortion. It's very controversial. And some people believe you can't use birth control because they believe that's a form of cutting up, cutting off life. Some religious denominations believe life starts at birth. So my ultimate decision was that it is the woman in consultation with her family and with her doctor to make the decision. Part of that also stems from being a teacher. Um, my friends and me who are educators have been faced with 11 year olds raped by grandparents, sometimes their father, sometimes their uncle. And what do you do? When I've knocked on doors, I've had people yell at me and say that if the 11 year old is impregnated, she must carry the child. And I respect that viewpoint. Um, I've had other people that say that child is a child and should not be forced to have a baby. So it's a very hot topic. It's related to our most deeply held beliefs. And after a lot of prayer and discussion, my conclusion was that I did have to support the right of women to make this decision. Now, there's three parts to the law that's still on the books that was um, not in practice now because of Roe versus Wade. I think 
an essential aspect is that no medical professional who does not believe that abortion is correct should ever have to conduct an abortion. And some people disagree with me on that. But I feel that just as I believe the woman has the right to make the decision, I believe that health providers who, from their own faith and conscience, can't participate should never have to participate in that. The other issue, the end-of-life issue, I really would like to hear from people about that. I don't have... Um, I don't have a, well, well, on the issue of a woman's right to make these health decisions, to me as a woman's right, I have a lot of questions about the end of life. Um, I think it's called uh, death with dignity. I have been around a lot of relatives and friends at the end of their life who certainly are people that when people want to pass that law, they're thinking of. And I've seen many families achieve reconciliation from estrangement, sometimes in the final days of their life. And because I've observed that, um, I can't say which way I stand on that issue. Um, I know the journal had a heartfelt editorial supporting it. I know friends who feel passionately because they know people who've had such pain and have lived with pain sometimes for years incomprehensible pain, they feel that that person should have the right um, to make a decision. There was a 12-year-old in Europe who had a lot of health problems who made that decision in a much more liberal situation, and that troubled me. So this is something I'm going to have a poll on my homepage and my Facebook page about because I really want to hear where people stand. And I always appreciate when people don't just say platitudes or negative things, but they give thoughtful presentations of their views. There's a lot of clicks, one clicks where people affiliated with um, organizations across the board, um, they'll click it and it sends the legislator an email. So sometimes you'll get a hundred identical emails, but the ones that mean the most to me are the ones that say, Dear Representative Garrett, I want to weigh in on this, and this is why. So um, I don't have, this is how I'm going to vote. I, as always, you have to see the legislation because there's a lot of um, heated arguments, but sometimes the legislation's very different than what people are saying or what different interest groups are saying. So I do expect to see that legislation. I'll read it carefully. And it's probably my number one issue that I want to hear from constituents from. I listen to people across New Mexico because my votes affect everybody. They don't just affect District 29. But this is one where I really want to hear deeply from people on. Um, so you'll put that poll on your website. So I'll, I'll throw in a plug for you. Yeah. Um, her website is going to be joy, the number four, NewMexico.com. You might have to give her a little bit of time to put that poll up, or I, I haven't. Yeah, seen I'll the put it up closer to the session. Okay. Not not right now. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, obviously <laughs> not right now. But feel free to write <laughs> anytime. <laughs> but uh, additional information on is on her website at uh, joyfornewmexico.com, and uh, if you want to contribute to that poll, feel free to do so as well. Now, uh, Joy, one issue that seems to just be hiding beneath the surface is human trafficking. Mm. Um, you know, from a long time, my personal place was I, I just assumed, yeah, it takes place, but I know it's, you know, somewhere on the other side of the Pacific, it's, it's, not, it's not happening in my backyard. Um, it, recent news has kind of unfolded on, a, on more of a federal level with, you know, pedophilia and human trafficking, mm -hmm. sex crimes, those type of things. We're, we're hearing news of networks like Nexium and certainly Jeffrey Epstein on federal levels. But mm -hmm. more closer to home, uh, we've got the I-25 and I-40 corridor. Um, common sense knows that uh, a lot's going on there. Uh, have you given much issue to this thought? And, and, and what are you convinced of and, and willing to pursue on, on this issue? It's a problem. And um, we had a hearing on it um, in the legislature this year. There was, I believe it was a memorial or a bill, I don't remember at this time. We also have the issue in the Permian basement. 
because um, in reading about human trafficking, wherever you have a lot of men, young men, living all together, um, that's a site of trafficking. So people who worked in North Dakota on the oil fields actually came down to New Mexico to testify because there is human trafficking going on um, in the southeast part of the state because of the concentration, the availability of money, and not a whole lot to do. But there's definitely sex trafficking on Central. This applies to both young boys and young girls. And of course, people who are vulnerable, uh, runaways, they don't have a place to live, they don't have a source of income. Someone who knows how to manipulate, who's very pleasant, will say, I'm here to help you. And the next thing you know, they're being trafficked. Uh, unfortunately, we had some horrible cases right um, at one of our local elementary schools. The parents were trafficking their young daughters. Mm. And so um, we now have a task force that looks at some of these issues. Um, I've written to the secretary of CYFD to always ensure that there's a teacher who is a classroom teacher because often it is the teacher who is in daily contact with a student that is first um, to pick up signs of something going on. So in one of the recent cases, um, Claire Moran, who works with the Attorney General's office, worked after working on that case with teachers and community members, worked to bring education about trafficking into the public schools, to the police, because you're so right, Jason, we think not here, and for those of us who are fairly middle class, who have jobs and, and decent relationships with our children and our relatives, it doesn't occur to us. But um, as some of the recent journalism has shown, some of these kids come from healthy, good backgrounds. They have a fight with their parents. They run away. And the next thing you know, they're being trafficked. So um, we'll be continuing to work on this in the next session. It is a serious issue. Right, right. Um, so, by the way, um, I'll extend this one more time to you. If you have questions uh, for Joy Garrett, uh, you're welcome to log on. I've got a couple more myself, but I uh, want to echo uh, and extend that invitation one more time. If you have any questions for her, uh, please log on. You can go to churchaliveabq.com, uh, log into the Vimeo. You can chat that way or on our YouTube Live or Facebook Live posts. I'm going to check all three in just a few minutes, so if you have a question, uh, now would be the time to uh, go ahead and extend that, and we'll take a look at it in just a few minutes. Um, one additional question, two additional questions, well, three additional <laughs> questions I have. Ask away. <laughs> uh, the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, you know, that's something that's obviously extremely important to the church. Um, it encompasses our freedom of religion. Um, also, First Amendment uh, as a whole, freedom of speech. Uh, where are you on this? Well, I totally support it. Um, freedom of religion is one of the building blocks of our country. And uh, my own ancestors um, on my mother's side were Mennonites. And they left Switzerland because the church in power at that time, which was actually the Roman Catholic Church, um, objected to them and um, pushed them off cliffs and burned them at the stake and things like that. So in my own ancestry, it's, it's a profound issue. And um, I'm just grateful that our country has the Constitution because we always go back to that. New Mexico is very diverse. We have everything from the traditional practices of our pueblos and our tribes. Um, we have strong Muslim population, Jewish population, Buddhist population, and I don't want to leave anybody out. And then we have our diverse Christian denominations and traditions. So it is really the building block of our country, and we have to really support it. Um, freedom Assembly, um, this is a hot topic right now because as we're having this interview, it is June 4th. We've seen in relationship to George Floyd's um, tragic uh, death, we have demonstrations and protests going on across the country. Um, all of them are motivated by a peaceful purpose. Um, other people manip manipulate the situation. Looters, we have unpleasant things happening. So it's a precious right, 
and we really have to value it, protect it, and not ever take it for granted. Um, yeah, certainly it's uh, that's front and center right now with everything with George uh, George Floyd. You know, it is uh, very very difficult situation, but uh, you know, simultaneously that is great um, in the sense of the right to peacefully protest is is uh, very important. Um, Second Amendment rights, uh, where do you stand on this? I totally uphold the Second Amendment. I am one of the sponsors of the Extreme Risk Firearm Protection Order, also commonly called the Red Flag Law. It was shocking to me to see the amount of misinformation that was spread about this law. People said, you're coming for our guns, you're taking our guns. No. This law is only for situations where family members feel somebody's at risk for suicide by firearm or somebody's at risk for using their firearm to kill other people, like a mass shooting. And a family member has to go to law enforcement and then if the law enforcement feels this is legitimate, only then does the law enforcement officer go to a district court judge and ask for an ERPO um, ruling. Now, I've talked to people who are working on this in Bernalillo County. They're very, very careful. Um, one of the detectives that supported this bill gives the example of someone who was suffering from mental illness and, and was a firearm owner and threatened to shoot any health worker that came to the door through the door. And he tried every tool in the toolbox of a law enforcement officer to work with this woman and finally concluded that it's only this kind of law that would allow law enforcement to remove the firearm. So I just want to tell people this is a very narrow tool. Um, my own late father-in-law's fiance was actually murdered by an estranged ex-husband. Um, a close friend, a teacher's daughter, might have, this, her suicide might have been prevented. And um, unfortunately, there was so much rhetoric around it that people didn't read the bill. Um, so I just want to say that it's important that the rights of gun owners are protected, but we also have to think of community safety on the other hand, and of course the safety of our law enforcement. So I'm really happy to see how many of the law enforcement uh, departments in our state are working together with the courts and the sheriffs to really craft the process of how this bill is implemented. Because you write your bill, but, and then it's passed and the governor signs it. But then the implementation is the next step. How do you do it to protect the rights of everybody involved? So I'm happy to see that that's taking place. Okay. Um, so I'm going to extend, if you're comfortable, take a look yeah. at chat and see if sure. uh, anyone's logged on. And then uh, I'll follow up with one final question myself. So. Okay, and if people have questions down the road and, and you put them on the Church Alive Facebook, I'll try to check in and answer them. So it, sometimes you're in the situation, you have no idea what you'd ask, and 10 minutes later you think, oh, I wish I would have asked her that. Yeah, exactly. Let's see. Facebook looks clear. Let me check YouTube. And let me check Vimeo. And Jason, I just want to thank you again for hosting not only me, but all of the people running. And, and I really respect anybody who runs. I may disagree with some of their positions, agree. It doesn't matter. It takes courage, takes guts. And um, so I just want to thank all the candidates who are running and who've ever run. Well, and I appreciate the time uh, you coming in. Honestly, um, it's, it's, it's such a reward to actually sit down with all of the candidates and as many as we possibly can, we will do. Um, it gives me an opportunity to get to know a name with a face, and that's yeah. really the heart with all of this. And then obviously, you know, allowing somebody to dial in their convictions and know where you stand as they go into the booth. And so I appreciate all of that, but uh, it's, it's great to have these conversations for sure. Um, it looks like we're clear on chat. Um, as Joy has shared, she'll keep an eye on additional chat 
conversations, anything in the videos that, uh, uh, that you may have down the road, uh, she'll extend that as well. One last question that I have, before I do, you can, I'll echo one more time, you can go to Joy, the number four, New Mexico, spelled out completely, N-E-W-M-E-X. ICO.com. <laughs> I had to think about that a second. Uh, if you have, if you want to know additional information on Joy or where she stands on some of the issues in our community, um, and then also my question would be this, and I extend it to all of the candidates as well. How can we be in uh, prayer and support for you? Pray for me. I mean, we we try to pray for everybody, but as an elected official. Um, I don't have all the answers. There's some people that roar into office and they have this agenda, boom, 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 boom. I'm a little bit different. I want to make people's lives work. I want to help them achieve happy families, you know, jobs, education, a safe community. I don't have all the answers. And, and some people don't realize legislation doesn't just grow out of our heads fully formed like the children of Zeus and that old myth. Um, most of the legislation that I've done starts with somebody talking to me. Um, I observe things, they observe things, and we say, let's do something about it. So citizens, residents, you're just as important as the legislature. And it's a process. If you're an expert on something and you want to see a law made, talk to your legislator. It doesn't even have to be your own. It can be me and maybe I'm not your legislator. But we collaborate to make our state work. It's not just you or just me. And vote. I, I believe you can go to nmvote.org. You can check your registration, see if you're at your proper address. Um, if you want to change parties, you can change parties online. If you've never registered, you can register online. To me, it starts with the vote. There's some very close races. Um, the person who held the seat before me won his race by nine votes. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And, and that's, you know, your vote really does matter. Your voice really does matter. So I just want to encourage everybody to vote and exercise. It's a precious freedom, and not everybody in our world has it. Absolutely. Uh, echo that 100%. Uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing that we have is the right to exercise our our freedom to vote, and uh, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, Joy, thank you for coming in and spending time with us and uh, just, you know, being candid about some of these questions, and I certainly appreciate your time with us today. Thank you, Jason. I, I was really honored to be here. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you to everybody that listens to this. Absolutely. All right, guys. Have a great day. Blessings. Thanks.